Welcome to D-Lab. Still putting the final touches on this beautiful Johnson Viking 2. One thing that I want to cover that I normally don't cover is the repair and checkout and alignment of the VFO. So I have a VFO 122 that we're going to team up with the Viking 2. But before you do that, there's a couple things you need to look at. So here we are backside of the Johnson Viking 2. And you can notice that there are two SO239 connectors, okay? This one is your RF output. This one is the VFO input. You gotta be very careful that you don't reverse those connectors, right? Now next to the VFO input jack is this octal plug, all right? So if you have your VFO 122, this is the plug that simply goes in there and then you take your SO239 and you spin him on. Okay, you get the idea. But sometimes people connect different VFOs to the Viking 2 and sometimes that can cause a real issue, which it has done on this Viking 2. Let me show you what's going on. Well, here we are, bottom side of the Viking 2. There is the back side of the 8-pin octal socket that I was telling you that the VFO normally plugs into. If you take a look, right down there, you're going to see a coil. And it's like all melted. Kind of looks like a big old caterpillar. I thought, uh-oh. And if you take a look here, there's a green wire. It's kind of hidden by this coax, but I'll show you. comes up here, goes down there. And do you see what I see? Yeah, she's all melted. So what happened at one point in time is somebody either connected a wrong VFO or some other device and it shorted the filament line to ground. And they don't fuse the filament lines, right? Because it's a high current line feeding all the tubes. So they hope that you don't do this. There should probably be a fuse in line back here, but Johnson never did it. So unfortunately, this wire, it's all cooked, goes into the wire harness, goes over here, you can kind of see it moving the harness over there. So what I need to do is a little, little bit of bypass surgery. So I'm going to cut it, pull this wire out, come back into the harness where I find that it's not melted, and I'll splice in a new piece, and then the caterpillar, it's got to go, right? And then I'll check and make sure, of course, that we have 6 volt present, which I'm sure we do. It just got hot. Somebody saw smoke and said, holy crap, and they shut it off. Here is another thing I really don't like. Somebody put in a line cord and they use these butt splices. You know, when I was a kid, putting car stereos in under dash, I used a lot of butt splices. But I don't use them anymore. So what we're going to do is find the cord right here, the AC cord cut those off and solder them to these coils like they should be. This was an okay approach to get the job done, but not acceptable in my book. I got the camera laying in the bottom of the radio, so I hope you can see us okay. So we're just gonna clippity-doo-dah the old metal wire there. Clean back. Somebody has already been in here in the wire harness messing around a little bit because a lot of the uh, ties are broken. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit of interference here. Grab some long nose pliers. Come on. Probably a little bit of melting going on holding her in there. I melted it into other wires because they do not see any ties. All right, let me cut and get this thing out of here. Yep, yeah, so as I thought, it's actually melted into these other wires. That could be a real problem. You think about it, mixing your 6 volt filament with maybe a high voltage line. That'd be a mixture for burning up a transformer. So anyway, still have some evidence of melting here but it's cleaning up at this point where it's hanging a left going into the harness so I think 
in this area is where I'm going to splice in the new wire. So uh, disregard that statement about uh, splicing. It was melted all the way back to this terminal board and you can see right there is the filament line coming off the power transformer. She was cooked all the way to it so I'm going to unsolder this wire right here. We'll put a complete new run back to the VFO. So since I'm going to be working on this terminal board with a caterpillar, we're going to go ahead and get it out of there. Because obviously I'm not going to leave that melted thing in there. I'll probably make another one. Oh, there goes the phone. Well, there it is. Crispy critter. So I've rewired that 6 volt line going over here to the terminal board with some nice high quality 20 gauge wire put in a new coil so the caterpillar is gone next step I need to repair this line feed get rid of the butt connectors and then we'll fire this thing up and make sure we got 6 volts going to that VFO output socket so I'm getting ready to re-terminate the AC lines to these coils on the bottom side like they should have been without the butt splices music of the night Ace Freely's Anomaly, and the wine of the night is this nice cab by Three Thieves. Can't do that work without the wine. Look at that mess back there. I gotta clean up the shop. All right, let's get the AC terminated. I got the AC line reconnected. Had to extend the wiring on the uh, accessory little crystal socket for the TR switch. I don't know why Johnson wires some things tighter than a guitar string. There's no reason for it, so I extended that. And then when I was in here, I saw a resistor over here, a 68K, that looked kind of toasty. And sure enough, it was about 15K high. So I swapped that out. So we are finally at the point where we can turn this thing on, make sure that the socket back here is all active, and hook up the VFO. See, sometimes... It's not as easy as what you think. There's always something, right? All right? I got the meteoroid set up, monitoring that pin of the socket. Turn on the old filament switch. What do we got? There she is. I got my six volts. That's what I wanted to see. All right, so before we hook up the VFO, there's something I have to show you. This is what I wanted to initially show you, but I got diverted. This VFO, the VFO-122 is actually pretty much the same circuitry as what is in a Ranger or a Valiant. Okay, and you've seen my videos on the Chernobyl resistor. Well, guess what? This also has it, and it's right there. You see that old carbon cigar? That should be an 18K resistor, right? And that feeds the OA2 regulator. So if that resistor starts going warp drive, she'll flame out just like it does in those other transmitters, the old Chernobyl effect. So let's see what it measures. 27.7K, that should be 18. So this guy is getting ready for disaster, right? So if you have a VFO-122, check and change that resistor. I don't even care if it measures good. Change it out with a wire wound 20K 5 watt resistor. That's what we're going to do. So here is the new resistor roid. Going to go in place of the old cigar ramus. And then that will eliminate the possibility obviously of it going up in flames. But the biggest benefit is you won't have a drifty chirpy VFO. New resistor is installed. It's a good time to take a little deoxit. Hit your selector switch. And then get in here and lube the mechanism. And you also see this is loose. It's because this nut back here is loose. So I'll tighten that up. Lube everything up. Put the cover on. Fire it up. Alright, so the VFO is connected. Powered up. I have a crystal in select number one, the VFO is zero, okay? So crystal-wise, let's take a look at her grid. There she is, I can peek it with the buffer. I can adjust my drive, all right? Let's go to zero. I'm gonna have to readjust 
a buffer. There she is. And the drive is about the same. So the VFO is working. Currently we are on 40 meters. So that's a really good sign. The VFO is operating and now we don't have to rely on crystals to run the Viking 2. Another common problem it seems with the VFO input on the Viking 2's is that the threads on this connector seem to become damaged. So you're plugging in the PL259 and then the threads bind. Okay, I've seen this on quite a few of the Viking 2's. If you were to take another SO239, same connector, she'll thread right on. Okay, So you definitely want to pay attention to this rear jack because if you're trying to put on the VFO cable and it won't thread in <clears throat> all the way like we got going here, you can see you still got slop. There's still slop in the ground connection. So it's not very secure. So it's always been a mystery to me why is the VFO SO239 the one that is usually damaged and the RF output one that's used a lot more is not. Is corrosion getting into these threads? I don't know, but I'm going to have to change it. Alright, so this brings me to the portion of the video that I really wanted to cover to begin with, but some other items got in the way. And that's calibration of the VF122 VFO. All right. So the manual says tune in your receiver and spot your VFO and look at the dial and then adjust these little trimmers on the back. Okay. There's an easier way, at least in my opinion, and that is to take the output of the VFO and just take it into a freak counter. Because on 80 and 40 meters, it's going to read direct. Okay. So I'm at. 3.85 megahertz on 80 meters and look at there so when I adjust that dial you'll see the frequency counter following it and this is also a really good way to check stability of your VFO now let's go to 40 meters alright same deal I'm on 40 meters approximately 7.2 megahertz you can see we're a little high so you could get back there and adjust your 40 low and high trimmers and tune that in, okay? Same deal. You can just watch it on your frequency counter. Now, the tricky part comes when you go to 11 meter band because you're not going to see 27 megahertz. Let's see what you get. So I'm on the 11 meter band and I'm at approximately 27 megahertz and you can see that I'm actually at 6.7 megahertz. You're like, what in the heck is that all about? Well, when you go to the higher frequencies, you have to use the multiplication sections in the Viking 2. So the actual 6AU6 oscillator will give you a multiple of 2, and then it goes to the buffer and it multiplies it times 2 again. So you end up with a multiple of 4 total. Okay? So you got 6.7 megahertz. So if I say, 6.7 times 4, I get 26.8 megahertz. But I didn't go all the way out, okay? So let's say I want it exactly at 27 megahertz. So I can divide that by 4, and I should be seeing 6.75, okay? So if I sit there and dink around with this thing, oop, I'm going the wrong way. Alright, so by the time I see 6.75, I'm actually about 27.2 on the dial. So it's out of calibration, okay? So if you said, well, you know, I would rather have my calibration right at 27.2, I can say, say 27.2 megahertz, but by 4, I should see 6.8. You can see we're a little low. So I could get back there. I'm a little 11 meter trimmer. Okay. I can tweak that trimmer. See there? I can take it to whatever it needs to be to calibrate that dial without having to spot on a receiver. 
to me, this is a far better method to get that VFO tuned right in. So that's a wrap on the VFO repair and calibration and connection to the Johnson Viking 2 transmitter. Hope you enjoyed the information presented. Lots more to come from D-Lab Electronics.